So a very warm welcome to the first Wednesday series of webinars from NSF. Uh, my name's John Johnson, and I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the, the FDA warning letter. So something that happens in your career, hopefully not too often, something that is often uh, a little dramatic. It can uh, certainly knock your uh, business off beam. It can certainly lead to a number of unbudgeted costs. So we're going to be talking a little bit about, in this particular edition, how you respond to the FDA warning letter. How do you maintain credibility and trust with the agency? And some of the best practice to make sure that you get back on track as soon as possible. So we're going to be uh, spending about uh, 40 minutes together going through uh, some interesting case studies and slides that show the best practice in this area. So, of course, you know me. I'm John Johnson. I'm a VP with NSF Health Sciences, a qualified person since 1995, based here in the UK. And my uh, career, both in industry and also with NSF, has been largely related to business transformation projects, uh, getting sites ready for MHRA, uh, WHO, or FDA uh, inspections, and then uh, looking to um, maintain that level of compliance through culture change. So um, if you've been following these, uh, these webinars, you probably saw that I did the first one. Uh, it's good to be back with you today. So let's dive straight in. So what we're going to be talking about is that point from receiving your FDA 483 report. So the FDA have done your inspection. They've left. Uh, hopefully you've cracked open a bottle of champagne or if it's gone poorly, a bottle of whiskey. And you're now contemplating what happens next. And assuming that the FDA 483 is lengthy or has a, a number of systemic issues or issues related to misbranding, or adulteration, you know that the chances are you're going to get an FDA warning letter. And that really feels like strike one. You know, to use that baseball term, having an FDA warning letter feels like strike one. It's, uh, it's not a great moment in your career, uh, but it's absolutely recoverable if you do the right things uh, in strike two and strike three. So we're going to be talking you through how to respond properly uh, and thoroughly and professionally to that type of issue. So we're going to go through the typical life cycle when you get a warning letter, the types. We're going to talk about the immediate uh, actions to take after the inspection and before you receive the warning letter. We're going to talk about some of the best practice in uh, preparing for your uh, GMP remediation program and really setting sail, you know, getting the wind in your sails and the right uh, navigation to get to where you need to get to as quickly as possible and in a way that's sustainable. So obviously, if you anticipate that you're going to get a warning letter, you know that you're going to need to make a significant upgrade in the GMP compliance of your quality system uh, or facility. We're going to talk a little bit about the warning letter itself, uh, inspection readiness, and I'm going to give some uh, tips on how to tackle some of these difficult questions. You know, some of the questions that will come up may be the type of question where it keeps you up at night, where it makes you kind of look into middle distance and, and, and worry and, and be concerned that your team, your facility may not be able to make uh, an effective response to that particular issue. So we're going to give you some tips on how to, to manage those difficult questions. So... The typical warning life cycle uh, is, let, let's take it from the very start. Uh, so your inspection is completed. <clears throat> You've received your FDA 483 report uh, in the final closing meeting, and you're anticipating that you're going to get a uh, warning letter. And right the way from senior management through to shop floor, that's always a, a, a tough message. It's always a, a disappointing and tough message and very typically, you know, like we see in all sorts of uh, discovery and life cycles, the first thing you often see amongst your team is disbelief. You know, I can't believe this happened. Why did this happen? Who is to blame? Where should I be pointing my resources? Uh, is this really true? There's a degree of denial as well sometimes. 
And certainly with people perhaps who have not been that close to the facility or are not intimately involved in the quality system, there can be a degree of anger. And these are quite natural emotions. Uh, There's no great surprise. But the sooner you can move away from these, um, the better. We often find, though, that as people move away from disbelief, denial and anger, there is a period of stasis. You know, the wind hasn't gone, gone in the sail yet. People don't know what to do. They just have a sense of shock. They uh, know that there is now not just a facility to run and customers to service. There is now a GMP remediation program or a business transformation program or a culture change program that's going to be needed. And that can sometimes really overwhelm companies. And that uh, period of stasis can be really troublesome. You know, again, you want to move out of stasis into acceptance as quickly as possible and try to be objective and open in your communications. So, of course, once you've got through uh, disbelief, denial, anger and stasis and you've got to a degree of acceptance of, of what has happened, it's then about assembling your team of subject matter experts, getting that diversity of experience, diversity of perspectives so that you get real expertise in re responding uh, and, and putting together a written response with that team. Oftentimes, companies will utilize their corporate QA team to help them with this as an independent reviewer. Oftentimes, companies will ask uh, independent GMP consultants to help them with that. Um, but it's important that the subject matter experts actually own that response themselves as well. Then, of course, you want to uh, actually meet with the FDA. You want to show them that you are committed from the top of the organization down to put things right and to maintain them in that uh, condition. So a face to face meeting can be very useful uh, to convince FDA that you're utilizing the right resources in the right way and that your glide path to GMP uh, compliance is uh, suitable. Of course, then you can then uh, freeze or um, um, approve your CAPA plan, uh, focusing primarily on prevention rather than just correction. You can then execute all of those tasks against a project charter and uh, verify the effectiveness of all of those tasks, sometimes with an independent reviewer, sometimes with somebody from corporate QA, but really being very strict on ensuring that whatever you do in terms of CAPA is actually achieving what you set out to do. Because then hopefully, and this sometimes can be as much as uh, 12 to 24 months after the original warning letter, you want then to be confident that you can have a reinspection by the FDA and know that you're in good shape and that you can get back onto the right side of compliance. Of course, this isn't really a cycle. You know, uh, once you've had a successful reinspection, that uh, arrow here on the top left should should be broken and you should be in relatively plain sailing and maintaining your uh, business in a state of perpetual compliance. You know, uh, the, the, the worst firms, the firms that we see have uh, continuing issues are those that just keep going around this cycle, either on an individual facility basis or across a network of facilities. And that can be very, very debilitating to their business. So what types of uh, warning letters are relevant to us? Well, the first one, of course, is the general warning letter. So this is one where companies have uh, had listed against them a number of significant violations to the CGMPs. And uh, these would be related primarily to either systemic or repeat issues, to issues that undermine the ability to make a product that is uh, is is uh, properly branded or uh, free from adulteration. And um, if a warning letter is uh, required in this uh, situation, you know that you're going to have to respond not just to the FDA 483 report, but also to the warning letter that's coming. So the FDA is not required to issue a warning letter if enforcement action such as a consent decree is needed. However, in most cases, they will uh, provide a warning letter as a precursor to that uh, market action. Of course, the other type of warning letter comes from either uh, inaccurate or misleading marketing and advertising uh, claims. But we're going to focus really on the general warning letter for 
uh, pharmaceutical facilities. So once you've got sight of your GMP deficiency, either during or after the FDA inspection, the first thing you really want to be sure about is do your team have the GMP knowledge to actually tackle this issue? Do they realize that this issue is a CGMP violation? Do they understand what good looks like? Uh, do they understand what best practice looks like? So oftentimes companies will uh, do a, a fairly detailed review of the expertise and experience within the team to make sure they understand the issue correctly to start with. You know, obviously you're going to develop some very uh, ineffective CAPA if you don't fully understand the GMP concern uh, in the first place. So making sure that you've got the expertise, the experience in house, or you uh, bring it into your team in some way is obviously very important. The second part, of course, is about making sure that you can properly define the problem and making sure you understand the true root causes of each of those GMP violations is really important. You know, I think it was Einstein that said that uh, a problem that's well defined is a problem half solved. So rather like uh, Sherlock Holmes here, if, if you can understand all of the steps that led to that GMP violation, all of the contributions from engineering, uh, QC, microbiology, operations, production, uh, QA, then you'll have a much better idea of how to resolve it. So it is worth taking the time to fully understand how you got here, why you got here, and what the scale of the issue is actually uh, that, that's causing so much concern with the FDA. So have been very forensic and really investigating each of those issues and understanding how they arose is absolutely crucial. And then, of course, once you have this uh, idea of, of root causes, you can then structure a, a corrective action, a preventive action plan to best effect. And you notice from there that I've underlined and emboldened the P, uh, the P meaning preventive action, um, because ultimately, any action that you take has either got to reduce the severity of a recurrence, reduce the frequency of it recurring, ideally to eliminate it if, if possible, or at least minimize the, the degree of recurrence, and or to make any violation much easier to detect, much easier to uh, preempt and to prevent being a, a crisis in the first place. So reducing severity, frequency, and improving detectability is what your CAPA plan should do. And that aligns really nicely with ICH Q9 quality risk management. So the inspectors have left the facility and obviously you've got a call to action. Um, you need to assemble your cross-functional team of experts from a variety of groups, uh, whether it's engineering, QC, facilities, development, uh, whether it's corporate quality groups, even whether maybe it's your clients or the license holders. But it's very important to make sure that everybody's aware of what's happened. Everybody's very transparent with their communication about what's happened. And everybody puts their shoulder to resolving these problems in, in a good way. Now, oftentimes, of course, uh, particularly if the FDA 483 is lengthy, you really are under the gun now. You've only got up to 15 business days to write a detailed written response and get back to the FDA. So there is a very intense period then where you designate an owner for each observation, you investigate the observation and you begin to propose some CAPA plans that have proper uh, target completion dates, which are realistic and credible and that you assess the impact both to uh, patient safety and product quality against every single uh, violation so that you're absolutely sure that each CAPA is uh, addressing the issue in full. Of course, uh, many times firms will put together a, a project charter or a project team. They'll have daily meetings to get this response together. And um, they'll try and put together a, a team, perhaps that's uh, headed by a secretary, a, you know, a really good uh, uh, writer, a very good um, compiler of reports, who can then consolidate all of these disparate responses into one uh, coherent voice, one coherent 
commitment to doing the right thing. Of course, making sure you do the right thing is one thing, but you also want to make sure you do it in a timely manner so that the uh, impact on uh, batches that are uh, either in the market or work in progress or batches that are for the uh, supply chain in the future have as minimum impact as possible from these observations. So it's really important to set realistic but challenging due dates. I mean, very realistic, but you need you really do want to get these things fixed, resolved and prevented uh, as soon as you possibly can. Of course, this often involves uh, uh, an increase to the budget, you know, remediation an emergency remediation budget is often needed. And making sure that your senior managers, even your finance people are met with either daily or at least weekly to update them on what you need, how you need it and when you need it is really, really important. And then fundamentally, of course, you plan to get that response back to the FDA within 15 business days electronically with any uh, attachments or evidence of completion of key actions. So um, before you send that response in, I, I thought it was quite useful to have a little checklist of key questions that you should ask yourself before you put that uh, response in. So the first thing is, have you responded on time? Uh, did you fully understand the finding? And did you find the true root causes? Um, it's really important to consider all of the root causes and even consider human error factors. And what's, what significant impact human error may have had in your uh, GMP violation? So that again, you're thinking very hard about not just, for example, upgrading master manufacturing records or SOPs or GMP records, but you're also thinking about training, competency, proficiency testing, quality culture, quality mindset, uh, management uh, style, and making sure that whatever you've done to fix the issue is actually going to keep it fixed for the long term. Of course, you'll have to ask yourself, did I respond to all the findings? It's amazing how many times I check people's responses and there's uh, errors or omissions. So every single nickel and dime, every single dot, every single crossing of the T needs to be checked, verified, and uh, a suitable kappa put to it where necessary. So you need to be really clear that you've not missed any of those individual findings or detail. Of course, you also want to make sure that you've looked not just at the issue itself and that particular um, uh, instance, but also any related instances or related systems that could also benefit from CAPA in those areas, or indeed to look at other products that could have been impacted by the same issue um, or could be impacted by the same issue in the future. So it's really important to look holistically across products, facilities, and uh, across instances as well. Now, a very good tip here as well, particularly if you're a quality director of uh, a network of facilities, is to make sure that you share your FDA 483 report, your FDA warning letter, and your responses with all the other relevant facilities in your network so that they can benefit from this, they can learn from it, and they can put their own capper in place ahead of their uh, GMP inspection from the FDA. You know, we've all seen, you know, from uh, a variety of sources on the internet through freedom of information, where one facility in a network suffers from some GMP violations and the FDA give them a warning letter. And then the FDA move on to the next facility in the network and the next and the next, and they find repeated issues. That's a really serious place to be. And it shows a kind of dysfunctional corporate quality and knowledge management system across the network. So it's really important that you look to see whether these issues are systemic or across your complete network and respond accordingly. You know, give your uh, opposite numbers, your quality directors and your uh, operations directors the benefit of what you've learned so that they can put things right before they're hit with the similar issues. Of course, at this particular point, this is not the time to defend your current practices. That time was long gone. That would be done during the inspection. And uh, that's your best opportunity really to defend uh, what you've got. So you really should be focusing on your key improvements primarily at this point. 
And then, of course, despite the fact that you've got this uh, this Gantt chart, you've got this set of post-it stickers or tokens that define your project, um, and uh, oftentimes firms can feel somewhat overwhelmed with all of those tasks, you've got to be sure that you've got them in the right order in a project plan, that they're realistic, and that all of the relationships between the tasks are properly defined so that you're doing everything really well just the once without any wasted time on rework. So having a, a detailed project plan and using some of the project uh, management tools such as Gantt charts can be extremely helpful in this as well. So when you structure your CAPA or regulatory response, um, here's a, a kind of a mnemonic or a rubric that shows some of the key aspects of your response. I mean, first of all, you've got to acknowledge that you had an issue in the first place. And uh, really, you should have defended your current practice at the time of the inspection. But if there was some degree of uh, misunderstanding or ambiguity, then uh, it is OK uh, in exceptional circumstances to uh, add in your response uh, some form of either acknowledgement or uh, a challenge to the details or facts around it. So you're trying to actually verify whether the observation was a fair, rea fair reflection of reality and uh, to give additional details or context in your response as to why or why not that particular issue is important. Of course, the next step is to show that you've had detailed further review across the site and other systems so that you're verifying that you've looked to see where else that problem may lie. You're looking, of course, to explain to the agency that you have actually defined in a scientifically justifiable way at what point the issue started and at what point the issue ended. That's so-called bracketing, so that you can be absolutely sure that everything outside of that bracket is unaffected by the observation. Everything within that bracket has got to be uh, addressed and resolved uh, in full. Of course, then the agency expects you to give some details of the uh, root causes, uh, the product impact, the patient safety impact, um, making sure that uh, you've set your kappa in a way that will help uh, prevent recurrence, uh, prevent severity or make the issue more detectable. Then moving on to what did you do immediately to contain the issue, to prevent it becoming more of an issue or more of a crisis? What then you did to stop the issue through a corrective action? What's done to prevent the action uh, reoccurring? And then any interim issues uh, or interim tasks that you may need to do as well. And then finally, never forget that you need some sort of proficiency test or verification that the kappa that was done is actually effective in preventing recurrence. So all of those key steps are really good uh, aid memoirs when you put your response together. And they're expecting to see some degree of detail on each of those in the response. So this leads us to your warning letter. The warning letters now arrive. So first thing you're thinking about is what am I gonna do with this? You know, how is this affecting me? Am I going to be on import alert? Are my products going to be actually frozen at the dock? Am I allowed to release any more products? Uh, how is this going to affect the supply of my products? Is this going to cause a drug shortage uh, within the uh, territories that we supply to? And of course, oftentimes as well, the warning letter, you know, given that it's a very um, uh, visible and uh, transparent and accessible document, uh, that's uh, often uh, easily uh, identified through freedom of information, you need to oftentimes to notify your investors, your financial people, and consider both the cost of a GMP remediation program and also potentially uh, the impact of um, that uh, warning letter on your company's stock. So when you get the warning letter, it's quite a moment. And uh, I always think uh, for me, uh, with the dozens and dozens of these that I've read over the years as a consultant and also in industry, um, the first thing you should do is read it through quick, have a cup of tea, and then read it through line by line, literally sentence by sentence. 
because you've got to read it carefully to make sure that you understand in full where the FDA is coming from and what they're telling you to do. So it's good to read it quickly, but then take a moment, have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and then go back to it and go through it line by line. Of course, within the uh, warning letter, it will give you the required time frame for the response, and that's uh, often measured in days rather than weeks, certainly not months. And you would follow similar steps that I just explained uh, in actually responding to the warning letter. And again, you're expected for every violation, every perception, um, every fact that's within the warning letter uh, to do a detailed response uh, in the same way as you would for the pre-warning letter. So if you're a US based company, um, this is a tough situation because you've got to be prepared that any uh, license applications that would have been reviewed by FDA will now not be approved until you've proven to be in compliance. And more often than not, uh, particularly now we're through the period of the pandemic, uh, the next inspection will be face to face and likely to be 12 to 24 months on. Now, typically when we measure our <clears throat> lead times or pro program times for a GMP remediation program, it is often measured in terms of months. I don't think we see very many that are completed in six months. And oftentimes they can take 12, 18 or 24 months. And that aligns quite uh, well, actually, to when you would expect your um, local FDA inspector to come and visit you uh, again to confirm the compliance of your facility. So this has a giant impact on your business. If you're a foreign company, uh, so you're uh, placing products into the US market from overseas, uh, your products will be placed under an import alert. Now, although those observations may be just related to one product, the FDA will assess whether those impacts are also uh, appropriate and relevant to your other products uh, that you supply as well. So having your products on import alert potentially for 12 to 24 months, um, again, can be a giant impact on your facility. So, you know, we all know this prevention is much better than cure, but we're now at the warning letter stage. So what happens next? So did we respond to all the findings? Did we look at it holistically? Did we look at it as a systemic problem? We've mentioned that before. Did we look at the other sites in the network? Did we provide timeframes that are uh, that are realistic and credible and uh, based on good science and good pro program management? Did we actually provide in the cover letter to the FDA that some degree of assurance that the senior management, the, you know, the corporate and, and senior management of your organization acknowledge and take this issue very seriously and are willing to properly resource or budget for the types of changes and transformation that are required. So FDA are expecting to see in that cover letter a written commitment from your senior management that they are engaged in this and are willing to fix this uh, once and for all. Of course, it makes perfect sense to request a meeting with FDA and, and to be able to lay out your intent to, to fix the issues. And it's important to be completely transparent you know, unambiguous, very straight with the issues, holding back nothing. You know, the, the time it has long gone for trying to play games. Um, you've now got to have an open book process with FDA so that everybody makes the right decisions for the right reasons. Of course, you're expected minimum to provide quarterly updates to the FDA. In some cases, it could be as much as monthly. And you want to make sure that your whole team right the way through the organization, understand the findings, their significance, and that you're transparent with the communications with them as well. So they know exactly the impact this is gonna have on their employment, on their uh, priorities, their objectives for uh, the next foreseeable period. So thinking about the six critical steps in getting back into control, the first thing of course, is you've got to own it. And what I mean by that is, you as a quality director or you as the CEO or you as the operations director have to own it, but you're not the only one who has to own it. Don't feel that you're on your own. Don't feel that you're the only one who has to carry this on, the, on your back. You have to make sure that there's a myriad of people 
at various levels in various disciplines that are also owning their actions and owning their particular area of the business. So whether that's uh, owning certain procedures, certain record sheet, certain batch records, certain facilities, certain laboratories, you want to make sure that one of those critical steps is everybody understands the issue and owns and knows exactly what their role, responsibility, authority and accountability is in fixing these issues. So there's no substitute for this. Everyone has to own their part of this uh, story. The next step is to be really um, careful and very realistic in what can be done with existing support. You know, you ran a factory prior to the warning letter that was undoubtedly busy, highly engaged, people working hard, maybe people were working overtime or weekends. Uh, there was a lot of other business transformation going on. But now you've got overlaid on that a GMP remediation program. So you've got to be realistic on what people can actually take on. They've probably already got sacks of work on their back already. You can't just keep putting more sacks of work on their back uh, that are coming from your GMP remediation program. So being very careful about how you uh, allocate work, how you bring in uh, additional support can be very, very crucial in getting back under control. In terms of your CAPA plan and your actions that you're taking, you want to make sure that everything that you do can be proven that it's been done. So you want to have no ambiguity at all on whether a particular task has been completed and, and whether it's in place, in use and actually in control. So what do I mean by that? Well, the first thing to make sure is that when you uh, generate your CAPA plan, and you generate your body of evidence folder that explains what you did and what evidence you've provided for each task, do you want to make sure that first of all, you have something that you can show that proves the transformation that you've made. It could be as simple as a new version of a procedure, new version of a record sheet. Um, so you want to make sure that the, the change exists in the first place, you've physically got it in your hand. The second thing you want to do is verified that that change is actually appropriate. You know, does it fit? Does it meet CGMP? You know, when I compare it line by line against uh, the Code of Federal Regulations or CGMP requirements or WHO requirements, um, does it actually meet the minimum standards that are defined? So does it fit with the standards expected? The second thing to do with any of this evidence is to verify that it's actually in use. So it's no good just writing a procedure. Is that procedure actually in use? Are the operators following it? Are the analysts following it? Is it understood by everybody? Do they actually follow it and complete it and uh, have knowledge of that change, you know, verifying that what improvement you made is actually in use? And then, of course, the third thing is to verify the evidence of the task that you did actually works in practice. So has it actually created that improvement that you wanted? Has it reduced the severity of a recurrence? Has it reduced the frequency of a recurrence? Has it made a recurrence uh, much more visible? So you want to make sure that whatever task you've done has actually affected an improvement. That's crucial. And in your body of evidence file, you want to be able to show FDA that you verified that your changes are in place, in use and in control. Of course, you're going to focus on the FDA's key concerns, you know, what came up in the FDA 483 report and also in the warning letter, but also, you know, be, be expansive, you know, look at uh, a wider scope, look at, you know, how these sort of issues could have occurred elsewhere in the organisation or elsewhere in the facility and make sure that they're verified as well so that there is never a chance of a recurring observation of a similar nature uh, in your within your facility. Then, of course, a key step is to assemble the right teams. And, and I mentioned the word work stream here. What I mean by that is oftentimes, if you are responsible for an operation um, that involves uh, uh, raw materials coming into the facility, um, transformation of those raw materials into a formulated product, 
packaging of those products, testing of those products, you are already heavily engaged in that work. If you also at the same time have to effect improvements to that work, there is often a battle. And I've seen this many, many times. And what I mean by that is that <clears throat> if um, a client's um, product is uh, subject to a certain due date, and so is a Kappa plan, and there is only so many hours in the day, which job does that person do? Do they manufacture and test the product or do they do the improvement according to the Kappa plan? Now, you can't default against the Kappa plan. You have to complete those actions to the target completion date. But you've also got a responsibility to your shareholders and the clients and end users of your products. So some of the best practice that I've seen in a remediation program is to provide a work stream where some people are dedicated to the operation and do no improvements. And some people are dedicated to the improvements and don't do any operations. Just for that short period of time of the remediation program. So that you dedicate and separate the resources so that it's very clear who's doing what and why and that everybody's got a job that's contributing but is n there is no chance of a battle between operational needs and completing CAP to the target completion date. So work streaming your teams into either ops or GMP remediation programs is a really good thing to do. Of course, at this time, you're going to be backfilling. You may decide that you need some interim staff. You may uh, believe that you need some specialist consultants to help you. Uh, and all of that can be incredibly important. But also bear in mind as well that many, many times in these projects, people that perhaps you've not always um, recognized or spent time with or noted the work they do or the potential they do, sometimes these people in this kind of remediation program suddenly become so much more helpful, so much more impactful that they somehow become energized by the program and they become so much more valuable to your team. And these diamonds, these diamonds within your organization will become much more apparent when you're working a remediation program. So be aware of your own internal resources and the potential for maybe unseen people to really step up and make a difference to you as well from your internal talent pool. Of course, you want to create some success factors and these three C uh, success factors. Uh, I know my colleague Maxine Fritz is, is absolutely uh, on point on these. Uh, she is so um, focused on ensuring that your remediation program is served by the right culture, the right company culture, the right set of communication methods, and that the teams collaborate up and down the organization. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But creating the three C's in your remediation program is crucial. And then, of course, it's about then creating the strategy, the CAPA plan, and checking in regularly. So, before you set sail in your GMP remediation program, it's uh, kind of interesting to have a look at this photograph because uh, these uh, these sailors uh, are all sailing close to the wind here. You can see that everybody's got a job, everybody's uh, got a different degree of risk, um, but clearly you've got somebody at the back there who is a, a rudder. You know, they're providing the direction. Uh, you've got somebody out the front who uh, is the um, is the planner or the navigator, you know, making sure that it's sailing in the right direction. Um, and everybody's got a job. Um, and it's interesting, really, this photograph, because you can see as well that some people are sailing really close to the wind. This uh, chap whose feet are getting wet on the uh, right hand side of the boat there, uh, he's, he's living at a degree of risk there. Um, and he may, may, in the project terms, have um, a project task that is very difficult to achieve in the timeline, as opposed to the two guys on the top left of the photograph who look like they're just passengers. <coughs> they look like they're probably drinking uh, gin and tonic and having a cigar and, and uh, hardly contributing to, to what's going on. Their, their job may become much more important later on in, in the voyage, but uh, nevertheless, 
there is going to be a diversity of risk taking that goes on in sailing. And it's very similar with remediation programs. Why do I say that? Well, um, everyone's going to have a job. Everyone's jobs could be kind of different. Everyone may have a different degree of risk. And um, but it's still really important that there is a, a rudder. There is a navigator. There is a planner. Uh, there's people who are setting the sails and setting the resources and really keeping that speed up and moving the organization in the right direction. So let's go back to these uh, key success factors. So when I think of company culture, it's really important to take a while in a large GMP remediation program to confirm that the company has got a vision, mission and values that will underpin your GMP remediation program. That it has a clear vision that is it's shared with everybody on how we're gonna get back into compliance. That the mission is very clear in terms of step-by-step -step, um, tasks. And that the values you're gonna use, the way you work together, the way you resolve issues, the way you deal with conflict, uh, the way you deal with very difficult decisions or difficult subjects, all mirrors the values of the company. And of course, you're expected in these sort of situations to have a very uh, effective, blame-free culture, uh, to use this voyage, this program as a learning uh, experience. And that fundamentally, you, you've got to have a will, you've got to have a, a strength of character to do the right thing each and every time in a timely and logical manner. So don't underestimate the importance of culture and communications in the way uh, your program will develop. So in terms of communication, of course, communications up and down and across the organization have to be planned and measured and consistent and objective and convey um, development of the facility. You know, this may feel like a crisis, but actually you're trying to develop and improve, strengthen the uh, organization, make it more robust, make it more resilient uh, in the future. So you're actually investing in the overall organization and the human capital. And fundamentally, you want to make sure that uh, you think hard about the organizational culture and the organizational development. Have you got the right people in the right positions at the right level at the right stage in their careers? You know, do you have the expertise and experience that can communicate key information, technical information or risks in a way that management can, can act on. So communication is key up and down that uh, family tree within the organization. Needless to say, collaboration is gonna be essential and uh, building these objective and professional relationships is really important. There has to be a degree of trust within your organization, but there also has to be a degree of verification. So if I'm checking that one of my colleagues has done something to a standard that I thought it should be done. That's not a bad thing. I'm looking out for you because I'm checking and I'm supporting and I'm coaching you while I'm doing the checking. So that verification is, you shouldn't take that in a, in, in a bad way. Verification is good. Um, but also once verification is, is shown to uh, show um, uh, a state or a process or a facility that's in good order, then you can begin to develop, redevelop the levels of trust that you need in an organization in order for decisions to be made quickly. So that kind of balance between trust and verification is obviously very important because fundamentally, we all want to run our facilities. We want to create uh, uh, revenue. We want to uh, make products for uh, needy uh, end users. And we want to create a way of working that is enduring, that works for everybody. And that's really important. So when you think of the remediation plan as well, try and think about the chain of risk. So what do I mean by this? I touched on this maybe 10 minutes ago, that whenever you're thinking about what is needed to be done, your uppermost priority in all of this is, is the patients. And patient safety is your first and, and second thought, because you want to make sure that the risks associated with product adulteration and product misbranding are minimized. So when you see your FDA 483 um, uh, non-conformance, 
or an issue that's in your warning letter, your first thought is, is that uh, issue leading to either product adulteration or product misbranding? If not, you then start to think, well, was that issue uh, in contravention to our product license? Or was it in non-compliance with the compendia, the pharmacopoeia? Or was it something that we did that uh, didn't comply with the quality technical agreement that we had with our, uh, with our um, clients? Or indeed, was it a, a simple CGMP uh, deficiency or regulatory deficiency? And understanding which of those uh, buckets your FDA 483 item falls in is really important because it drives a certain degree of priority. So when you understand those uh, observations and the risks of them recurring, you want to make sure they're really well defined, really unambiguous, and you know when it started and when it ended. And you want to make sure that each risk has a description that shows how that risk was identified, monitored and mitigated in the past, how similarly it's identified, monitored and mitigated now. And of course, making sure that your CAPRA activities are uh, specific, measurable, achievable, and realistic and target orientated, um, making sure that you address them properly in the future. So you're looking back, you're looking at now, and you're looking at the future, and you're looking at the level of risk. And that should define the right quality and depth of kappa in your response. So as you go through your remediation program, you begin to start to think about getting ready for reinspection. You know, this could be anywhere from nine to 24 months since your uh, warning letter, and, and you've worked hard on your remediation program for a long period of time. And you've put together an evidence file showing all of the uh, uh, physical uh, evidence that you've completed those tasks, whether they're photographs, uh, change control requests, uh, new procedures, new um, record sheets, new manufacturing records, whatever it may be. So you can provide evidence that you did complete each and every action according to the commitments that you made to FDA. You also want to include in that evidence file any certification. So what did you do to qualify certain key roles? So for example, if there were a litany of relatively small GMP non-conformances, that tends to point to a poor or dysfunctional internal audit program. You know, why didn't I find these issues myself? Why didn't the internal audit or self-inspection system identify these issues so that we could fix them before the FDA found them? So in that case, you may be looking in detail about how to certify your internal auditors. How do you do a proficiency test? How do you upgrade their skills? and expertise in internal audit. Similarly, if you had a significant number of issues with investigation of deviations, um, customer complaints, out of specification results, out of trend results, you may realize perhaps that your investigator team uh, don't have the experience and expertise to perform that work and that you want to be able to upgrade their knowledge and then certify them to verify that what they're doing in the future is uh, of a suitable standard. So certification of key people can be very powerful in this as well. Of course, you're going to check every detail, no exceptions. You have to go through every nickel and dime, every dot, every crossing of the T to verify that everything's been done as it should be. And then, of course, you'll let FDA know that you're ready for reinspection because, of course, they want to verify that you've done everything that you should have done. And oftentimes, companies will then consider an independent mock FDA inspection, possibly with ex-FDA investigators or ex-regulatory agency uh, investigators. And the process of preparing, execution, and follow-up allows you to practice, practice, and practice and get ready for that reinspection. So... When you think about your most feared question playbook, uh, some key tips here, because these things are gonna come up in the reinspection. These are gonna be the issues that you kind of worry about, you know, when you're sat in a bar or watching TV or you're sat in the garden, maybe even when you're laying in bed and tossing and turning at night, uh, you may be concerned that these questions are gonna come up in reinspection. So having a playbook that acknowledges the issues 
links it to CGMP, uh, summarizes your current procedure or provides a context of the issue that gives uh, real detail on the present performance of the current system and, and the improvements that you made. It has a detailed uh, quality impact assessment and you summarize all the improvements that were related to the original FDA 483 uh, will really enable you to then uh, be much more comfortable in presenting a difficult subject to your investigator. But the key tip here is don't try to defend the indefendable. You know, don't try and justify bad practice. You know, if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. So be really careful that you don't um, undermine all of the good work you've done by trying to defend something that is just not defendable. Uh, and if, if it isn't defendable, you've still got more capper to do. So in summary, know the compliance of your company and facility, structure your capper plan, you know, be very focused on uh, the three C's, you know, just like Maxine uh, Fritz often tells us company culture, communication and collaboration are absolutely key. Verify the effectiveness of those commitments and get yourself ready for reinspection. So if you need further information, further details on the way NSF uh, perform these type of uh, programs and support companies around the world, if you go to uh, nsf.org and go to our knowledge library, there's a number of white papers, videos, webinars, and case studies there that show uh, our approach to this and our, our successes in these key areas. So do, please feel free to go to our website uh, and go to the knowledge library. So many thanks for uh, attending this webinar. Uh, hopefully that was uh, useful to you. I think we've run about 50 minutes. Uh, so um, I've enjoyed it. I've certainly really enjoyed it, actually. Uh, it's reminded me of a number of projects that I've done uh, myself before. Um, so needless to say, best wishes for your uh, next GMP regulatory inspection. Please feel free to reach out to Maxine or myself at any time via email or via LinkedIn uh, or via the website. And um, thank you very much. And um, hopefully we'll be looking forward to the next one in the, Wednesday, uh, the first Wednesday series of webinars. Thank you very much indeed.